Record as well. All right. So, uh, so today's lecture um, is uh, about non-perturbative physics. So, in the previous lectures, I've um, introduced to you uh, the way people deal with um, uh, some non-perturbative aspects, specifically um, the uh, part on distribution functions. But um, still, on top of that, one one considers uh, perturbative uh, scatterings. Um, but this time, we will consider uh, something that is truly non-perturbative. Uh, the well, the most common tools outside of just lattice gauge theory, which will be, uh, uh, which will be described uh, towards the end of the uh, course. So uh, the most uh, used tool is uh, something called the Wilson loop that we'll uh, just define just now. And then the Wilson loop itself satisfies um, kind of dynamical equation known as the makenko migdal loop equation. And also from, from the Wilson loop, we'll define um, uh, an order parameter for a, a phase transition in QCD. Uh, and generically, this, phase, uh, this order parameter will describe uh, the type of uh, phase uh, uh, of QCD that we are in. All right, uh, so let's start with the Wilson loop. The Wilson loop is defined by introducing in the theory some sources, um, some, so one considers uh, one can see there's pure gauge theory, pure annuals, and but inside it we add some external sources, namely some quarks of an uh, of infinite mass. So infinite mass meaning that uh, they are fixed at uh, a position and they cannot move. Um, and or, or equivalently that there are no um, there's no uh, they're not dynamical they're not um, um, since the mass is infinite their contribution to the path integral is uh, just uh, through a constant but um, all right so to to get to uh, to this let's define first. Uh, the Wilson line. So a loop will be a, a closed line, but for the moment, let's define a, a Wilson line. <clears throat> so the Wilson line is defined as the path ordered exponential of the integral of the gauge field um, going on this path from x to y. So this is an object that depends on the point initial and final points, x and y, and on the path between them, p. Uh, I mean, curly p. Um, <clears throat> so what does it mean, uh, path order exponential? It means that you consider infinitesimal, so you, you divide uh, the path uh, in um, uh, in discrete points, and uh, at some point n, you have a gauge field a mu and a position uh, xi mu n. Then you consider the exponent of i a, i a mu xi mu n minus xi mu n plus one. So this would be d xi if you want. The the discretized dig psi. And then you take the product of these exponentials 
product over n when n in the limit in the continuum limit limit where n goes to infinity, but the path remains the same. And the point is that uh, in general, if we're talking about Young Mills, a mu um, a mu is a uh, non-abelian, which means uh, non the, the various so a mu of x does not commute with a mu of y. So we have a mu a of x t a does not commute with a mu uh, b of y t b because t a does not commute with t b. Uh, so that means that we have to uh, define the the order in which we put the various a mu's, and the order is along the path in the way I've described here. Okay, so this path ordering is about uh, young males, about the non-abelian case, but let's consider the abelian case first to understand the concept of the Wilson loop. So the uh, abelian gauge field, A mu, transforms and the gauge transformations in the following ways. The variation of A mu is the uh, derivative d mu of some um, uh, parameter, if the decimal parameter chi. And uh, this Wilson line, phi of yx and uh, p, transforms in the following way. First, we note that the individual exponential in, in here, the individual exponential uh, in the uh, discretization along the path transforms like this. So in the exponent, I have a, um, a mu dx mu. Uh, uh, so that transform uh, i a mu dx mu that transforms into i a mu dx mu plus i d mu psi d, uh, d mu chi d psi mu. That is to say, since this is now a billion, this would be uh, I, uh, exponential i a mu d psi mu times the exponential i chi of x plus dx minus i chi of x. So this uh, derivative, I, I want to write it as just a variation of chi. And the point is that then <clears throat> um, the Wilson line is a product of such uh, uh, factors. And um, so it's the product of these kind of factors. And now I can put I can put this uh, uh, i chi of x plus dx to the left of the exponential with, of, with a mu, and the i uh, chi of uh, x uh, minus i chi of x um, to the right of, uh, I mean, keep it to the right. And then when I take the product, of course, um, so to the left, I will have i chi of x plus dx. But then, uh, since this is a um, this is a uh, uh, a product along the path, um, I will have another factor centered on x plus dx. So to the right of that, I will have e to the minus i chi of x plus dx, that will cancel among itself. So all the intermediate um, points will, uh, all the intermediate uh, gauge transformation uh, along the path will cancel. And the only thing that we will left with is exponent i chi of y, the end point to the left, and exponent minus i chi of x, the initial point, to the right, okay? So the transformation, so then the transformation of the Wilson line 
with initial point x, final point y, and path p is with exponent i uh, chi of y to the left and the exponent minus i chi of x to the right. Now notice I put this left and right. This didn't really matter because this was a, a, a billion, the abelian case, but I just put it like this because then it's obvious what will, that this uh, will go over into the uh, Yang Mills case. We'll, we'll, we'll describe that next. All right, then uh, the observation is that the Wilson line can multiply, can, uh, yeah, can act on a charged complex, uh, complex scalar field. So a charged complex scalar field transforms under gauge transformation by the exponent of i times the gauge parameter, uh, chi of x. So then if I multiply um, with a Wilson line from the left, right? Since this transforms with i minus i chi of x to the right, that cancels and we're left with the fact that um, Wilson line times phi is exponent i chi of y, so uh, the endpoint of the path from x to y. So that's a way of saying that we have defined parallel transport along the path p from x to y. Parallel path transport meaning that the properties of the object, in this case the complex scalar field, are preserved but they're just translated to a different point. Uh, so initially we had phi of x, so the point was x, but now it's translated this gauge transformation from x to y along the path. Okay, so that was the Wilson line. So the Wilson line was useful because it defined parallel transport. But now let's consider um, the Wilson um, uh, the Wilson loop, which is the case of a closed curve. So the closed curve P is now called a closed closed uh, uh, loop C. Uh, so I just put y equal to x, but I have to remember that there's still uh, this closed loop C. So I have the phi of x, x, and c, and it transform, transforms uh, uh, like exponent i chi of x to the left, and exponent minus i chi of x to the right. And uh, well, now in this abelian case, we remember that, we can remember that uh, the order in this case doesn't matter, so I can put it uh, to, the, to the left as well. And so, this object, the Wilson loop, in the abelian case is gauge invariant, right? Um, being gauge invariant, that means it's a potential observable. I mean, a priori, one could uh, find a way to, to, to measure this uh, uh, Wilson loop in the abelian case, okay? All right, let's consider now the non-abelian case. In the non-abelian case, the gauge transformation is a little bit more complicated. So the, the final gauge transformation uh, in the case of uh, coupling one, so when I just absorb the coupling into the fields uh, is, um, is it with, with uh, gauge, um, well, uh, which gauge matrix omega of x to the left, uh, it's inverse omega minus one to the right, and then minus i d mu omega, omega minus one. But the gauge matrix uh, omega of x 
is the exponent of i times this uh, gauge, the same kind of gauge parameter we had before, uh, which can become infinitesimal. So in the infinitesimal case, um, I will get from this variation, we, we would get that d, uh, sorry, not omega, I'm not sure why I wrote this, this is a typo, of course. DA uh, mu. So uh, DA mu is the covariant derivative of uh, of uh, chi. So let's uh, repeat the same argument from the abelian case, but now with this um, this new non-abelian. Uh, uh, gauge transformation. So uh, the point is um, the gate, the, the Wilson loop is still defined um, as a, a dis by discretization. So I have this uh, uh, this exponential of an infinitesimal uh, thing, i a mu d xi mu, by which I mean xi mu of Xi mu n plus one minus Xi mu n. Um, so this is approximately equal to one. And then we have, we have an, well, uh, we have a product of it with a, with a number that goes to infinity, total number that goes to infinity. So if if, if the exponential is infinitesimal, then the exp uh, the, if the exponent is infinitesimal, then the exponential um, is approximately one. So it's approximately one plus i a mu d xi mu. <coughs> um, but uh, but then we've seen um, we've seen that uh, what that the transformation is. So was uh, a mu transformed with uh, omega omega minus one plus d mu, d mu omega d omega minus one, right? Um, sorry, um, there's an i missing here as well. Right, is i a mu d xi mu, omega omega minus one, and then here is minus i times i is plus. Uh, <clears throat> all right, but but again, now I can reform exponentials. Uh, in particular, what I'm interested in is the exponentials of these uh, uh, chi's of x. So. <clears throat> um, Since omega is uh, is uh, the exponent of i chi, I can write this um, so I can write this one as omega omega minus one, and then uh, I have omega to the left, omega minus one to the right, and in the middle one plus i uh, a mu d xi mu. That's this term, and then this term um, I I can write dx mu d mu omega as dx mu d, d mu of the exponent uh, of i chi, which uh, is um, um, Which amounts to um, uh, the exponent, the so so if I multiply this with uh, I'm sorry, I yeah so. These, these things are non abelian so we have to be careful with the orders. So exponent i chi of x 
plus d psi mu d mu exponent of the same amounts to exponent i chi of x plus dx, right? Because um, um, well, I, I write this at, as exponent i chi of x plus exponent i um, uh, exponent uh, d psi mu d mu chi uh, plus uh, d psi mu d mu chi, and then there's an expel This is exponent i chi of x plus d psi mu d mu of the exponent. All right, so all in all, what we get is exponent i chi of x plus dx to the left, exponent minus i chi of x to the right, and in the middle, I have this one plus i a mu d psi mu, which can approximate it again with exponent i a mu d psi mu. So here we've always worked to, uh, to first order in, uh, in the x, uh, the, re the reason being that um, here in the exponent we have the psi mu, and um, uh, as we said, we have an infinite uh, product of these factors defining uh, the Wilson line. All right, so again, the same argument as before. When I take a uh, product of these things, so this is defined at x. To the left, I'll have the same thing defined at x plus dx. So then uh, the, the, uh, the thing, the exponent to the left will transform with e to the minus i chi of x plus dx to the right, which would cancel this exponent minus i chi of x. Uh, um, this, sorry, the, this uh, exponent uh, i chi of x plus dx to the left of this one. So all the intermediates, uh, all the intermediate uh, uh, gauge uh, per, uh, factors will cancel, and only the endpoint, um, only the endpoint uh, exponents will remain. So the Wilson loop, like in the abelian case, will transform with e to the i chi of uh, y, the endpoint, to the left, and with e to the minus i chi of x, the initial point, to the right. <clears throat> so the difference was that in the abelian case, we did this um, just to emphasize, just to, to uh, to, to make us, to prepare us ourselves for, for the non-abelian case. It didn't matter the order in that case. But, uh, but now the order matters. So uh, now we really have to put um, exponent i chi of y to the left and exponent minus chi of x to the right. The order of um, uh, of uh, gauge fields and uh, uh, gauge transformations um, matters. And again, um, from, the Wilson, from this Wilson line, we can define the Wilson loop, which will be, um, with, which will be, uh, oh, sorry, here is capital Phi, the, the Wilson loop, um, with, um, endpoint equal to the initial point, uh, y equal to x, so phi of x and x. But now, the, depending on the path, that becomes a loop c. So this depends on c. And note that now, however, this is not gauge invariant. It's gauge covariant. So this now transforms with exponent i chi of x to the left and exponent minus chi, um, I, minus i chi of x to the right, which is not the same as the original Wilson loop. But this is a 
covariant transformation, the way, uh, for instance, the, um, the field strength, F mu nu, um, the non-abelian Young Mills uh, field strength transforms, right? This is a covariant uh, transformation. But, um, but we know how to make, uh, we can, we know how to make uh, a, a gauge invariant object out of a gauge covariant one. Um, we can um, we can take a trace, right? Well, in the case of F mu nu, the trace itself is zero since that that all the terms are just uh, just have TAs which are, are traceless. But um, but to get in the case of field strength in the action, I have uh, the field strength squared, and that I take the trace. But for the Wilson loop, the the gauge uh, invariant object in the non-abelian case is just the trace itself of the of this uh, phi of x of x and c. And uh, two observations: one is that it doesn't depend on this x. I mean, of course, x. Initially, I had uh, in, in an initial point x and final point y. But now that I have a closed loop, it doesn't matter where I start. It's it's uh, all the same. So phi is really depending only on the, the loop c. And the other observation is that one uh, usually defines it with one over n. Um, uh, if um, this in, is in the gauge group SUN, the reason being that the trace then has n terms. Uh, so to get something of order one, I have to di divide by one over one. And this is just a uh, convenient normalization. OK. <clears throat> All right. So. In the abelian case, uh, the Wilson loop, I said that was um, uh, inver gauge invariant. So in that case, we can actually make it ma manifestly gauge invariant. So we didn't need to go through all that, uh, uh, all that um, analysis. Well, that was pr preparation for the young male case. But in any case, we didn't need to get, go through all of that. We could have seen. Uh, di directly, that's gauge invariant by using the Stokes theorem. So since I have now the exponent of i times an integral over a closed loop that is the boundary of a surface S of a mu d dx mu, the Stokes the theorem tells me that this integral of of, over a loop that's the boundary of a surface of a mu is in is equal to the uh, integral over the surface of uh, f mu nu, which is the antisymmetric derivative of uh, a mu, times uh, the element of surface, which is d sigma mu nu. Right, so then since this is written in terms of the gauge invariant f mu nu, that's a manifestly gauge invariant, right? In the non abelian case, however, there are, if we try to do the same thing, there are corrections to the explicitly invariant form. Um, so, so if um, so let, let's consider uh, a small uh, square of uh, side uh, A uh, in the mu nu plane. Let's, then let's define the uh, object, so I'll call it phi, remembering the notation for uh, Wilson line, uh, depending on this square and depending with indices mu nu. Then, uh, so let's define this as 
exponent um, i a squared mu nu plus uh, oh. Oh, um, let me rephrase this. So let, let's consider the Wilson line. Uh, Wilson Wilson line. Well, not the the Wilson. Uh, this object phi of x and x and and c. Um, but uh, where the where the loop c is the square of side a. Uh, de defined in the plane within this is mu nu. So phi bo uh, box mu nu, I will call that. Then this will be equal to i, uh, exponent i, a squared f mu nu, but now plus orders, uh, but only in the first order in a squared. they are corrections of order a fourth. So then the Wilson loop, which is one of n trace of this thing, is approximately equal to. So remember, this is uh, this is uh, just to first order in a squared. So let's expand expand this. Let's not write it as an exponential. Then this is one uh, minus. Uh, so the trace of uh, f mu nu is uh, zero, as I just reminded you before, before, because for SUN, uh, the, the trace of the generator is zero. So then uh, the, the next non-zero order is actually this uh, um, a to the fourth term. So, so to the next, to the to the first non-trivial order, one of n trace of this phi is one minus a to the four over two n trace f mu nu f mu nu. Then the correction is a to the six. But note here, since this was depending on mu nu, there's no sum over mu nu. Mu nu, although it appears twice, I don't. I don't have the Einstein summation on, uh, uh, convention. This is just unsummed over mu nu. Um, so we see then that the Wilson loop now is also explicitly gauge invariant up to or higher order than a to the six. Well, it is in fact the Wilson loop. We have proved it's gauge invariant, but I said it's manifestly explicitly gauge invariant only up to order a to the fourth. But moreover, if I sum over mu nu, then I obtain, well, a constant times the action, the kinetic term in the action. This is one of one example of why the Wilson loop contains all the non-perturbative information from the gauge theory. We, have, we see that from the Wilson loop, we can obtain uh, the action that defines the theory. Well, okay, that's not even uh, perturbative, it's just classical, it's a classical action, but that's, uh, that uh, tell, that's a, a, a clue that indeed uh, the Wilson loop contains um, the full non-perturbative information of the gauge theory. All right, let's consider next uh, uh, some information that we can get out of the Wilson loop. So the action is uh, well trivial, but uh, let's something let's see some, something that's non-trivial, something that is non-perturbative, and it's difficult, very difficult to calculate um, otherwise. I mean, you can obtain something like it from, 
you can obtain um, um, something like this from uh, from lattice gauge theory. But uh, but the simplest way to obtain it, even in lattice gauge theory, is from the Wilson loop. So that is the quark anti-quark potential. So, the, so initially, the Wilson loop, the first application of the Wilson loop, was already this the quark anti-quark potential. Now, when I say quark anti-quark potential, I have to um, to define what I mean. Uh, the quarks have various, the, the real quarks have various masses, though even the up and down quarks are nearly massless and um, and the uh, bottom and top are really, uh, you know, extremely high mass. Uh, Charm and Strange, in, uh, they're um, uh, intermediate. But what really what one means here, remember that we're, um, what we're at the, the dynamical theory is actually pure Young Niels, pure glue theory. Uh, so then the quark anti quark potential is, is the potential between infinite, uh, infinitely mass, massive uh, quarks, sources, external sources, this infinitely massive quarks that I in introduce into the theory to probe it. Okay. So to calculate this potential, I consider the Wilson loop for a specific um, for a specific uh, loop C, the one the one where I have this. Uh, so if I have infinitely massive quarks, that means that uh, they sit still. They put they don't move. So let's consider this line going up uh, in uh, in uh, time. So this. This would be the time direction, and this would be a space one space direction. So, uh, so the quark goes uh, um, goes forward in time, and the anti quark uh, we can think of it as a quark going backwards in time. So, um, so let's consider this line the for the Wilson loop. This line going up and this line going down of a very uh, long, uh, for a very long time. So this T, the length of uh, this line, be very long, uh, large. And then let's connect, let's consider, put them at, um, at the distance R. That is, you know, small, com very much, much smaller than T. Uh, and then uh, complete the loop by, putting these uh, spatial lines. So now we have this rectangle with uh, one side, T, much, much higher than uh, the other, R. <clears throat> then we can prove rigorously that the vacuum expectation value of the Wilson loop, so, uh, so the Wilson loop, this, uh, this object that we define in here is uh, a quantum object, right? It's a quantum variable, but uh, as usual, we can con consider its uh, vacuum expectation value, um, expectation value in the ground state in the vacuum, and uh, the we can prove rigorously that in the case of uh, very large uh, time, so this capital T going to infinity, this uh, vacuum expectation vacuum value is proportional to exponent of minus this large T times the quark anti quantum potential depending on the length R defined in the loop. So I said we can prove this rigorously, but we can also fi uh, find this, that this is true, uh, but not so rigorously. Um, in this way, <clears throat> so we add we add the infinitely heavy quarks as sources. So how we how would you add sources to a theory? <clears throat> well, we would add this term integral d four x 
uh, gmail x the, the uh, source and then times the gauge field a mu of x right on the other hand uh, the potential for the quark for the fixed quark is e a zero of x the quark and for the anti-quark is it charges minus e so minus e a zero of x so substituting um, so equating this so um, so saying that we have uh, j mu equal to this uh, just this uh, static charge e so just j zero so just e delta delta of x and then the, the antiquark has only j zero this uh, the, the the potential um which is minus e delta of x substituting this in the source term I get integral over dt e a zero of x minus e a zero of x. Right. Um, actually, I should have said it's not so for and for one of them is that the point is x for the other one is x plus r or minus r. So this term then is just uh, the the term in the exponent in the Wilson loop, but uh, only the, the, the largest part, the, this part and this part, right? So in the exponent, I have a mu dx mu, right? Which con which for this uh, this sides corresponds to uh, a zero dx zero dt that is. Uh, with one sign on this and my, the other sign, so minus on this line. So this is a, just a correction, as I said. So this thing is approximately equal to this integral over C of A mu dx I mu. Okay, so that's uh, an in, a simple way of figuring out why we have... Um, we have this, and uh, uh, sorry. So, so, I, so, so then, then uh, what we obtain in in the end, we obtain the potential. Uh, we we'll, we we'll obtain the potential. Um, uh, the potential times. Uh, integral of dt is just t, right? So this is um, so uh, this source term that one adds to the action. So in order to obtain the vacuum expectation value, uh, then co corresponds to uh, i times t this large t times the potential i said we said this is the potential potential q q bar so so exponent i t q v q q bar but then after v rotation to euclidean space is e to the minus t v q q bar um all right so that's that's uh this argument is, is uh, you know, very heuristic. It's not rigorous, but one can prove this rigorously. All right. So why is this uh, quark antiquark potential interesting? Well, of course, um, you might say, well, um, why? See, since if we're thinking about the um, if we're think, thinking about uh, Young Mills pure Young Mills theory, why is it interesting to see the potential between source uh, 
quark and anti-quark? Well, because that defines the phase in which the gauge theory is. If we are in a confining gauge theory, then we find that this potential VQQ bar of R is proportional to the length uh, between. So it's proportional to R. It's sig sigma approximately equal to sigma R, where sigma is called the QCD string tension. Now, what, 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 what does physically mean this? Physically, this means that um, I have, uh, so a linear potential means I have a constant force. So it, if you if you put a quark and an anti-quark in this uh, theory of glue, you cannot pull them apart. Uh, you have a constant force, so there's no way to 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 pull them apart. Uh, no matter how far you 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 put them, there's always force, be same force between them. So another way they are confined to be together. <clears throat> Uh, confinement also refers to um, if you have real QCD, uh, the, 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 the real theory that we're, we, of the real world that we're interested in, then in, in the real world, if you, have, uh, if you try to pull together uh, a Q and a Q bar, what will happen is that there are uh, flux lines that form a tube, so the electric uh, flux lines between Q and Q bar, uh, young mills electric lines, for, form a tube. So in, in uh, electromagnetism, the, the flux line between uh, electron and positron don't form a tube, they form you know, that, that shape, that kind of uh, shape uh, that you might have uh, seen in a simple experiment in physics, if you put, um, uh, if you put some uh, iron uh, dust with a magnet, and, uh, with a man some magnets, you see uh, the lines between, uh, between uh, two poles, the, between the, the poles of a dipole, you see uh, lines spread out uh, throughout uh, time, throughout space. But uh, in uh, young mills theory, these flux lines are actually confined into this flux tube. So, um, so then the flux line density, um, the flux line density is a, approximately constant throughout the tube. That's what means that the flux lines are confined to the tube. Uh, but this flux line density is proportional to the energy density, since the Hamiltonian is proportional to uh, electron field squared over 2 plus magnetic field squared over 2. And since the cross-section of the tube flux tube is constant, uh, that means that the total energy is proportional to the length. Excuse me. Uh, just a moment. Ah, um, uh, so, um, so that, that is what is a confining gauge, confining gauge theory. So the quark antiquark potential is proportional to the length. On the other hand, another possibility is to have a conformal, conformal gauge theory, something like QCD. Conformal means that uh, it doesn't... Uh, Oh. Conformal means that it doesn't um, um, uh, doesn't have a scale. So, uh, conformal invariance is a generalization of scale invariance. Uh, so, this is in particular like QED. Uh, QED doesn't have a mass scale. Uh, 
um, well, I mean, there's a mass of the electron, but that's very, very small. So when we say, think about QED, we think of a, a theory of without the scale. Um, so it's scale invariant, but it's actually even conformal uh, if the um, uh, electrons are approximately massless. And then in that case, the potential can only be of the Coulomb type. It can only be of the type of uh, a constant divided by the length. So one over the distance between the quark and the quark. Why is that? Well, that's because the VEV of the Wilson loop in the conformal theory, as I said, should be proportional to E minus uh, the time, this time T times the uh, potential. And the potential is a <laughs> constant over, over R. So in so this we have e uh, proportionality with e minus constant uh, t over r, and t over r is the um, uh, is uh, invariant under scale transformations. So the t over r defines the um, defines the the closed loop C, uh, and if I scale the theory, I scale both T and R, and so T over R is um, invariant. So that's the only possibility in a conformal gauge theory. Now, in a conf confining theory, we, th we then obtain that uh, this uh, VEV of uh, Wilson loop is proportional to E minus uh, the string tension times T times R. But T times R, is the area of this loop, okay? So in a confining gauge theory, we obtain that the VEV of the Wilson loop in this uh, theory is proportional to E minus uh, the, the tension times the area. This is called an area law. But moreover, um, moreover, um, since if I uh, consider, well, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm not very good at drawing things, so the picture here is not very illuminating, I suppose, but, um, if I consider uh, two loops, C1 and C2, of the type that I described here with, uh, with uh, time uh, direction much bigger than the space direction. So if, if, I put, if I put another one here, so you notice that then uh, the left line of the new uh, uh, of the new uh, loop will go up, whereas the right line of the left loop will go down. So these two um, uh, terms in the in the Wilson loop integral uh, cancel out. So it's as so when I put C one plus C two. When I put them like this, one uh, on top of the other, is this is as if I have just this uh, total loop C. Okay. So now, um, now moreover, in the large end limit for an SUN gauge group, the VEV of W of C one, W of C two is equal to the product of VEVs of C1 and VEVs of C2. So, uh, so considering this, then if I have some general, uh, general um, closed loop C, I divide it into uh, many of these um, uh, loops 
with uh, with uh, time direction much bigger than the space direction, right? Put uh, next to each other, and, and then, as I said, um, the integral of a mu dx mu, um, the sum of uh, the all of these um, all of these uh, uh, loops is equal to the uh, the, the the thing. The m of dx mu, integral of dx, m of dx mu over the whole loop C. Um, and then, moreover, I have this um, uh, this property that uh, the vev of the product is equal to the product of vevs. So that means that in the end, um, the vev of the Wilson loop in general is proportional to e minus sigma times area. We have this area law. We have this area law then for any, uh, well, th this this argument was, uh, was also a little bit, uh, was not particularly, um, was not particularly um, uh, rigorous, but uh, but we can we can make it rigorous as well. So in a confining theory, we have this area law: the web of the Wilson loop is proportional to e minus the string tension times the area. Now, in a Higgs uh, uh, in a Higgs phase of the gauge theory. Uh, Higgs phase means um, that the quarks are screened like in a superconductor. Um, so in a superconductor, if I put uh, if I put um, uh, charges inside the superconductor, so extra electrons or electrons in holes, Corresponding to quark and antiquark, uh, the potential is also uh, it, it has a the potential has a, a finite range. Um, the reason being that the photon becomes effectively massive through the interaction with the superconducting medium. Uh, so as you so. This, you, I think you remember that, uh, for instance, uh, the, the magnetic field is expelled from the uh, superconductor. Um, anyway, and the way to describe the superconductor is to say that the uh, photon becomes uh, massive in the superconductor uh, by, by interacting with, with, with the medium. And uh, if the photon is massive, massive the range of the electromagnetic interaction in the medium is proportional to one over uh, this mass, so it's finite. So that means that at at uh, at uh, distances larger than this range, one over the mass of the photon, the potential is uh, constant. So let's let's. Uh, 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 Let's translate that into QCD. Then we say that the potential between the quark and antiquark is a point, a, approximately a constant that I will call mu um, in this Higgs, Higgs phase where the quark, quarks are screened. Then, it, from, from, the, from what, what we said, that the Wilson loop VEV uh, is, should be proportional to the E minus uh, this potential times this uh, large time t, then the Higgs ve the the uh, Wilson loop vev in the Higgs phase is proportional to e minus mu times t. But t is approximately equal to uh, half the length of the um, of the loop, right? So t is this length. The loop, the length of length 
or a parameter of this uh, loop is t plus another t plus these two small uh, contributions that I can ignore. So, uh, so t is approximately one half the per perimeter or the length of the loop. So, so now the, the VEV of the Wilson loop is proportional to E minus a constant, mu over 2, times the perimeter of the loop. This is called perimeter law. Now, by the same argument as for the area law, I can ex extend the perimeter law for any smooth closed con curse, uh, counter C. And again, well, the argument I gave again is, is not uh, entirely rigorous, but uh, uh, we can make it rigorous. So we have seen uh, in a confining, um, uh, uh, so so in a confining uh, uh, phase, we have the area law. In a Higgs phase, we have the perimeter law. That is for. Uh, uh, confining gauge theory, but uh, but then for conformal gauge theory, I have a Coulomb potential. All right. So I said that this Wilson loop uh, encodes all of the, uh, in principle, all of the non-perturbative information about the uh, gauge theory. And uh, uh, I've shown you one example. Uh, I can get the quark and core potential, which actually defines um, the phase in which we are. Um, but uh, if it defines some non perturbative, um, all the non perturbative information, it should. Uh, obey some dynamical equation. The Wilson loop should obey some dynamical equation um, that defines this non-perturbative non uh, behavior. And that dynamical equation is called the makenko migdal loop equation. Um, it is simplest at for the SUN gauge theories at large n. Because in this case, as I already mentioned before, the VEVs of gauge invariant operators, so if I have gauge inv invariant operators like the Wilson loop, uh, the product, the, the VEV of uh, products of them is equal to uh, products of VEVs of uh, the individual operators up to 1 over n squared corrections. That means that the gauge invariant operators, O1 to ON, behave like C numbers, not as operators. Now, that, on the other hand, means that um, there must be a semi-classical saddle point um, of the path integral, defining the VEV, that there are, allows us to write the VEV as simply as a solution at the saddle point weighted by e to the minus, uh, um, minus the action. Okay, so the fact that, that we have this uh, equation, this factorization proven by Mignal, uh, shows that um, uh, we had a C number, so then we should have a uh, semi-classical saddle point. Then, uh, Makenko and Migdal, I've, I've, I've thought of the so-called master field, uh, a colorless uh, composite field, colorless uh, meaning without, I mean, without gauge indices, uh, phi of A, uh, 
and then the Jacobian for the transformation between the gauge fi field A mu A and this colorless composite field phi of A. This Jacobian defined here can be written as E minus N squared times a function J of uh, the composite field phi. Then uh, I can rewrite the path integral, which is in path integral over dA E minus the action, as path integral d phi, one over this Jacobian, E minus n squared S of phi. But my but I define this Jacobian by definition, I written it as E minus n squared J of phi. So then I get path integral d phi E minus n squared S minus J. And then by our assumption that these things should be, um, because they behave like C numbers, they should uh, be defined by semi-classical saddle points. I, should, I put the saddle point, I write the saddle point of the path integral. Saddle point means uh, the variation of the thing in the ex exponent should be zero. That means the variation of s with respect to uh, this phi is equal to variation of j with respect to phi, since I have s minus j here. But the variation of s with respect to a, a is this uh, um, d mu f mu nu a. And then, uh, and then, uh, phi is is traded for a mu. So if I have this equation, I should also replace ds with so ds with d phi equal d g d j d phi. I replace with this ds d a with d j equal to d g d j um, d a. But then the SDA is equal to this, so I have, I deduce this equation, which is, which is known as the master field equation. Okay, and that's, uh, so, so this is the, the equation uh, at large N, um, and it notes that it, I have here uh, J, which comes from the Jacobian of this uh, colorless field phi with respect to A. Mm -hmm. um, a, a natural gaze for the master field, which is gauging grant, that turns to be correct is the Wilson loop. Um, But moreover, one one can actually show that so so I can uh, I can obtain this J from the Wilson loop. But moreover, I can uh, show that uh, we can reformulate the SUN Young Mills at any n in terms of the Wilson loop, and any observable is given by a sum of a paths of Wilson loops. Uh, this is something that, of course, I'll not prove here. It's too complicated, but um, just to uh, inform you that, indeed, the Wilson loop uh, contains all the information. So to find examples of... Uh, of um, this um, master field equation. Uh, of, of sorry, of uh, observables. Um, if I write the, the product of two color, colorless uh, vector quark uh, currents, uh, this one can uh, rewrite it as 
uh, Gemini of uh, of the of the uh, of the loop uh, C times the web of the Wilson loop for for the uh, where uh, the sum is over points um, over loops that so 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 this is this is the observable and it depends on points x1 x2 and i write uh, uh, sums over paths that go uh, through x1 and x2 in this way right so this is sum of paths c j minu of c and w of c um, then the the connected uh, uh, correlators of three quark um, uh, scalar currents. Scalar currents are psi over psi. So psi over psi x l one, psi over psi, psi two, psi over psi psi three. The connected part. This uh, um, it's equal to the sum over x that passes uh, over loops that passes pass through. Uh, these x1, x2, x3 of some j of c times the Wilson loop. And j of c, um, if the, in, so in this case, if the parts were, were actually scalars, would be uh, equal to this, um, this thing where in the exponent here, the, we have the Lagrangian of the particle the, that stays for the quark and the Lagra this Lagrangian of the particle is proportional to the length of the contour <clears throat> because we have uh, infinite um, um, inf infinite mass Uh, for the spin of quarks, the things are a little bit more complicated, and this functions j of c and j minu of c that I, I wrote uh, here and here are uh, are uh, written here, which are uh, it's a bit more complicated to show. All right, but this this was. Uh, so these these were examples of uh, observables you can obtain this uh, um, web of uh, products of currents in terms of the Wilson loop. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, but let's let's go. Uh, let's continue with uh, our analysis in order to define the. Um, the Machenko McDowell loop equation. Um, so to, to do that, we have to define um, something called a uh, geometric ob object called the path and the area derivatives. So area derivative is um, an operator that acts on um, um, on a on a closed uh, on a function of a closed contour. So let's consider um, let's consider some closed contour like this, and let's single out a point C of X on the contour. And let's then deform the contour by adding a little bit. So I've added here just a little bit to the contour. Um, in the but this little bit is defined in the directions mu and nu. Okay. And then this extra bit of con contour. So remember, this is a point x. So here. I, I did. I added a little bit of contour, 
but uh, but it's almost closed, right? So because it has to depend on this point x. So so here it's an infinitesimal distance between them. So this extra bit is almost closed. And it has an area delta sigma mu nu. So the the um, Um, so this uh, this would be then called the contour with delta sigma mu. So the, then the area derivative of a function of a contour is what you expect it to be one over this variation delta sigma mu nu of x. Uh, the function on the contour with delta sigma mu nu minus the function uh, of the contour itself with just the point x here instead of this extra delta x, uh, the extra uh, variation. <clears throat> and of course, delta sigma mu nu, since we added the contour in direction mu and nu is something like dx mu wedge dx nu. That's, uh, that's the, uh, the, the area uh, element would be dx mu wedge dx nu. Um, now for the other object, the path derivative, let's consider uh, Let's consider something like this. So I have my contour defined with one point x uh, singled out. And then uh, at the point x, instead of so here, I've, I've added a, a closed, uh, almost closed uh, 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 contour defining an area. But now I have to find an almost closed uh, path but without an area. So I just go in the direction mu and I come back. I just go a direct direction uh, delta x mu and go back, but go back, you know, a little bit uh, above it, right? So that this is still almost closed at x. So again, I define, uh, uh, the, the path derivative as one over delta x, uh, the function of on this x uh, close uh, contour c um, def deformed by delta x mu minus uh, f of c with the point x, just just point x. Uh, now the standard variational derivative with respect to x mu of sigma can be written as a uh, as a combination of the um, of the um, of the path and area derivative in the following way so I, it's x dot nu of sigma the variation this um, uh, area variation, delta, delta, delta over delta is sigma mu nu of x of sigma, plus sums uh, over all the points xi of variation over with respect to x mu, and then the delta of sigma minus sigma with the point i singled out. Um, then the Macken comignal loop equation is written as uh, the uh, variation 
of uh, so the 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 the, the path uh, the the, um, uh, the path uh, the path the derivative of the area derivative of the Wilson loop so d mu x variation sigma mu nu of x is equal to lambda integral over the contour C of dy mu, uh, dy mu, so y mu note here on the left, I still have an index mu left because this is variation in direction mu, this is variation in directions mu and mu. <clears throat> then, so so here is integral dy nu, delta of x minus y times the uh, product of the wave, waves of the waves of the loops uh, of the um, um, of the loops y x and x y. What do we mean? So first of all. Since this is a product of waves, this is in the large n limit. Then lambda here is g squared n fi fixed. This is called Toft coupling in the Toft large n limit. So g squared goes to zero and to infinity, g squared n uh, finite called lambda. Moreover, then this, so I have a C and a CYX and a CXY. This is what I mean. So C, I have these points X and Y, then CXY goes this way, and then CYX goes this way, and together I make C. So C is the union of this CXY, CYX. But note that I have this in front, I have this delta of x minus y. So this x and y actually uh, have to be very close to each other, almost closed, right? The finite version, finite n version of this can be also written like this, but then instead of the, the uh, products of the uh, devs, I have the web of the product of the Wilson loops minus one over n, n squared, uh, the web of the Wilson loop of C. Remember I said that this web of products is approximately equal to products of webs with corrections of order one over n squared. In this case, this is the correction. Uh, so, you see, um, this uh, finite n, we have this uh, loop equation, but we don't have this, uh, uh, this factorization. So, you know, it's not an equation. So, this thing is an equation for Wilson loops that depend on loops. On, on, on waves of Wilson loops, right? This is a wave of Wilson loop, this is a wave of Wilson loop, this is a wave of Wilson loop. But here, no. Here I have a Wilson loop, but here I have a wave of product of Wilson loops. So uh, this equation is at finite end is more complicated. All right. <clears throat> Uh, finally, to say about the Wilson loop, uh, that it's, it's also an order parameter in the sense of Landau's theory of second order phase transitions. If you remember from uh, thermodynamics, Landau's theories of second order phase transitions, um, or the parameter, it, it means it is an object that has a non-zero value in an order phase and a zero value 
in a disorder phase. And let's see that. So for the Wilson, so I said Wilson loop is an order parameter. So in a con the, the disorder phase is the confining phase. And the order phase is the Higgs phase. The Higgs, Higgs phase because, well, um, I guess I haven't defined this yet, but in the Higgs phase, um, all the fields point in the same direction in some sense. So there's an order associated with the Higgs phase. So in the confining phase, uh, we have that the web uh, of the Wilson loop is proportional, of the area law is proportional to E minus the tension times area. Whereas in the Higgs phase is E minus uh, mu times the perimeter. Uh, and of course, we're using an abuse of notation by saying that the area law means this is zero and the perimeter law means this is non-zero. Of course, strictly speaking, both of these things go to zero uh, since uh, T is anyway um, uh, um, T is anyway uh, large. But uh, the point is that the confining one goes to zero much larger. Of course, I could in principle multiply both of these things with E plus and uh, exponent of uh, plus mu plus mu uh, times the parameter to make it more precise, but it, it will still not be perfectly defined. So um, we'll just keep this, uh, um, this, um, uh, loose definition. So uh, it is often the case also in the general um, uh, general theory of uh, Landau theory of second order phase transitions that we can define a disorder parameter, something that oppositely has a non-zero value in the disordered phase and the zero value in the ordered phase. Um, we can do that here also in gauge theories. That's an operator dual in some sense, the Wilson loop, meaning that its properties are uh, exact opposite to the Wilson loop. So this disorder parameter is called a Toft operator, T of C. But unlike the Wilson loop, this Toft operator can only be defined in the case that all the scalars are invariant under the center of SUN, the center of SUN being the cyclic group, group Zn. Now the center of a group is the subgroup of uh, the subgroup of elements that commute with all the other elements. So in the case of SUN, that subgroup is Zn, the cyclic group N. Um, all right, so let's define this Toft loop. The, the problem is it's, it's not very intuitive. You define very, uh, in a very abstract way. So let's consider a gauge transformation that depends on uh, uh, a curve C, so omega of C, in the sense that is singular along this curve. And then if another C prime winds through C with a linking num number N, then that means linking number means they link like in a in a same in a chain like this. So two two links in of a chain have linking number one. And then if this C prime is parameterized by an angle theta that goes from zero to two pi, um, then we will have that omega of two pi, omega C of two pi is equal to omega C of zero times exponent two pi i n over uh, little n, the linking number, divided by the cap 
cap the lamp off the SUN group. Then, so, so let's assume this is true. Then the Toft loop operator C, T of C prime is defined by the relation uh, Wilson loop of C, Toft loop of C prime is equal to Toft loop of C prime, Wilson loop of C times exponent of the same thing, 2 pi i times the linking number n of C of C with C prime divided by the n of S u n. Now, when we said that uh, this is dual or a disorder parameter, what we mean is, of course, that now we have in the disorder, in the ordered or Higgs phase, we have the web of the top, top parameter, uh, top uh, operator obeys the area law. It's proportional to E minus uh, sigma prime times the area, goes to zero. Whereas in the uh, disordered phase, the confining phase, the web of the Toft operator uh, obeys the perimeter law, so it's proportional to E minus uh, constant times the perimeter, so it's non-zero. All right, so we defined Wilson loop and Toft loop, and uh, uh, with respect to confining and Higgs phases, so um, and we talked about analogy with superconductors, where we also have a superconductors versus uh, vacuum, which is uh, uh, also uh, the case uh, of a superconductor. Sorry, sorry, superconductor versus norm, normal uh, phase, which is uh, also the um, um, the the point of uh, of Landau's theory, but um, you also remember that if you talk about some generic material, it does not necessarily need to have two phases, normal and superconducting. It could have many phases, and um, in fact, Toft shows that uh, gauge theories can have other other phases than the ordered and disordered phase, the meaning confining and Higgs phase, they can have so-called mixed phases where both the Wilson loop and the Toft loop obey some area law. <clears throat> An important uh, an important uh, uh, subcase of the Wilson loop that uh, it's so important that has its own name is called the Polyakov loop. Um, it's uh, it's a Wilson loop, but uh, defined on a quantum field theory that it's at finite temperature, uh, which if you remember from QFT. QFT1 at finite temperature means that this is in Euclidean space um, with periodic time, meaning the uh, periodicity beta is 1 over the temperature. Um, so if I have periodic time, that defines a loop. So the Polyakov loop is just the loop where the rectangular contour uh, with, the, the, with the time uh, direction winds around the, the periodic time direction. Now in this case, uh, we have a better understanding of why the Wilson loop, in this case Polyakov loop, is an order parameter. Indeed, in this case, the length in time is fixed. T is equal to beta and finite. That means that now, for the infinite contour C in the Higgs or order phase, phase uh, we have um, 
we have uh, that the web of um, the top uh, Polyakov loop is proportional e minus mu times t. So t now is large, but it's finite. So this thing is constant, it's non-zero. But in a confining or disordered phase, this is e minus sigma t, which is, uh, which is large but finite, but then times r, which when you make it large, uh, means that this can now actually go to zero. All right, so uh, this was uh, everything I wanted to tell you today. Uh, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? Can somebody verify that you can still hear me? Okay. All right, that means that you have no more questions. Uh, so uh, I will see you uh, next lecture at uh, uh, Tuesday at 10. We we'll go back to 10. So I'm actually finished with uh, CCPG, so I will not have that uh, disturbance anymore. Uh, so yeah, see you Tuesday at 10. Bye.